Welcome to Foraging uh, for Mushrooms on the SHT with Ariel Bonkowski. My name is Annie Nelson. I'm the Development and Communications Director for the Superior Hiking Trail Association, which is the nonprofit that protects, renews, and enhances the Superior Hiking Trail. We are so excited to host this webinar, Foraging for Mushrooms on the SHT, uh, to learn about one of the most adorable life forms we see on the Superior Hiking Trail, mushrooms. Uh, tonight, Ariel Bonkowski will teach us how to identify some of the most common mushrooms on the trail, both edible and toxic, how to harvest sustainably, uh, and follow rules related to foraging on public land, and more. To begin, I want to acknowledge that the Superior Hiking Trail is located on the traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabe people. At the Superior Hiking Trail Association, we work to improve the resiliency and sustainability of the trail for future generations, work we've been doing for more than 37 years. We lead by harnessing the power of volunteers, supporters, partners, and trail users to break down barriers engage participants and create deeper relationships between people and nature. Our association is honored to serve as the stewards and promoters of this North Shore treasure. If you would like to support our work and help cover the cost of producing this webinar series, please visit superiorhiking.org to donate or become a member of the SHTA. During tonight's webinar, if you have any questions, please ask them using the Q&A feature. We'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can at the end of Ariel's presentation. And now I'm thrilled to introduce Ariel Bonkowski, co-founder of the Lake Superior Mycological Society and owner of Ariel's Mushroom Co. Ariel is a self-taught mushroom enthusiast from Duluth, Minnesota, who has been studying fungi since 2016. She has worked as a mushroom identifier for the North American Mycological Association, Association and Foray Leader. Ariel also teaches mushroom identification classes across the Midwest and here on the North Shore and has given presentations for mycological societies all over the country. She also frequently forages on the SHT. So without further ado, here is Ariel. Hello, everyone. Um, I am Ariel Bonkowski. I am going to start this with just telling you guys how I uh, got into mushrooms. Um, I was actually kind of a mushroom hater when uh, growing up. I never liked eating mushrooms. I didn't like the, you know, the texture, the lack of flavor. Um, you know, kind of the typical responses you hear from people who don't like mushrooms. Um, but I was quite vocal about it. And uh, I was actually working at a cafe here in Duluth and I had a coworker, and I was telling them I didn't want to eat a certain dish because I had mushrooms in it. And um, he had just told me, you know, oh, you just haven't had the right mushrooms. You know, there's so many mushrooms out there in the wild that have different flavors, different textures, and you just got to get out and try them. And, uh, you know, I wasn't quite fully believing what he was saying. And he continued to tell me about a mushroom called chicken of the woods that's supposed to taste like chicken. And I very jokingly, you know, poke some fun saying, oh, you vegetarians think everything tastes like chicken. And he, uh, he was like, no, 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 this is a real thing. It really tastes like chicken. And um, I got curious. I went home, just did some searching on Google and found that it was a real mushroom and it grew in Minnesota. Uh, so I just casually joined some um, Facebook groups for mushroom identification based in Minnesota. Um, and I wasn't too, you know, focused on learning anything. I at least just thought the mushrooms were pretty and I could at least appreciate that. So, um, you know, after a while of being on some of those Facebook pages, you see some of the same mushrooms posted repeatedly. Um, so you would kind of recognize some of them the more frequently they're posted. And in 2016, I was hiking the Superior Hiking Trail with my husband for our honeymoon. And we were in the Devil's Track area, and I spotted this bright orange bulb-looking thing in the center of the trail, and there's a few off to the side of the trail as well, and 
I said to my husband, I said, I think that's a lobster mushroom. And he was like, how would you even know what that is? You've never liked mushrooms. And I was like, Facebook taught me. <laughs> and you could probably imagine his hesitancy. And we ended up collecting some of the mushrooms that we had found that we believed were lobster mushrooms. Uh, we got into town at Grand Marais and I then got cell service and I did some Googling. We also bought a foraging book uh, at the little bookstore they have in Grand Marais. And according to the book and our research, it was pointing to that I was correct. And we also posted a few photos to those Facebook groups just to get some extra confirmation that it was indeed a lobster mushroom and everything said yes. So we gave it a try and I actually ended up liking that mushroom. Uh, we had just sauteed it with some butter, salt, pepper, um, some garlic powder as well, and just served it over some mashed potatoes and I really, really enjoyed it. So from there, I, you know, had a foraging book in hand now, and I actually started to uh, practice identifying mushrooms, and I caught on pretty quickly, uh, and I had a lot of fun learning. Um, so I got a little presentation I'm going to jump into with you guys. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. So foraging mushrooms on the Superior Hiking Trail. So first off, what is a mushroom? Uh, a mushroom is the reproductive fruiting body of a fungus. And then a fungus is a network of like fine filaments known as mycelium that usually lives in soil or wood. You can kind of think of mycelium as like a tree and mushrooms as an apple. They really are just a fruiting body of a larger organism. Now there's not all fungus produces mushrooms. We've got things like molds, uh, toe fungus. It'd be really weird if we produce mushrooms from our toes. Um, and then mushrooms or fungi used to be considered a plant uh, until 1969 and then it became its own kingdom. Now different mushrooms have different ecological roles. Um, there are saprotrophic fungi, which gets its nutrients by decomposing plant matter. There is parasitic fungi, which gets its nutrients from attacking a living host like plants, animals, or even people. And then we have mycorrhizal fungi, which gets its nutrients from a symbiotic relationship with plants, meaning it has a mutually beneficial relationship. Uh, now, some mushrooms can have multiple roles. So for example, there are some mushrooms that will um, be parasitic and feeding off of a live tree, um, but then it will also continue to feed from that tree when that tree is dead. So then it'll be also saprotrophic as well. Now, learning just how to describe your mushrooms is going to be really helpful when you're trying to identify mushrooms. Now, mushrooms can have all sorts of different features. This absolutely does not show all the features a mushroom could have. This is just some of the basics. Um, we are just gonna talk about you know, each of these here, starting at the bottom. I will make note, I did not make this. There is a spelling error on this photo, so don't judge me on that. Um, but here, starting at the bottom, we have mycelial threads. So mushrooms do not have roots like plants do. Uh, they have that mycelium. Now, some mushrooms will have really, really strong, um, you know, mycelial threads that connect to that mushroom that will look like roots. Um, so noting if a mushroom looks like it has roots, those mycelial threads can be really helpful when you're trying to identify mushrooms. Next, we have a basal bulb. Um, that is basically like when a mushroom grows from like an egg. Um, so some mushrooms, particularly uh, in the Amanita genus, we will talk about that one later on, uh, that one grows from like an egg and will open up. Um, and then the rest of the mushroom will emerge from that egg. Now the top of that kind of egg shape is the vulva. So that's just the opening there. Now, when we talk about mushrooms, um, we usually don't use the term stem as we would with plants. Uh, we typically use the term stipes or stalks. Um, now on that stipe, you could see different 
patterns or textures or different features like that. Um, so you can see some scales sometimes. You could see maybe a reticulum, which is kind of like a fish netting pattern. Or you could see maybe a ring or a skirt on that stipe. Uh, if you do see a ring or a skirt on the stipe, um, that means at one point that uh, usually kind of like a fleshy, um, it feels very fleshy. It's kind of like a just a loose fleshy skirt basically. But if you see that, that means at one point the edge of that skirt was connected to the edge of the cap. So that is very important to note. Now on the underside of the cap, you could see a few different features. You could see gills, which is what most people think of when we think of mushrooms. Um, you could see teeth. You could see pores. Um, and that underside is where that mushroom is going to release its spores to help it reproduce. Now on the cap, you could see all sorts of different features as well. You can see maybe an areole, which is kind of like a crackly type pattern. You could see zonation. So sometimes uh, mushrooms will have like concentric rings or zones on the cap. You could see scales. You could see warts, not rats. Um, or you could see striations, which is kind of like a pleated look to the cap. Now, when you're trying to identify a mushroom, quite literally every single feature is important to be looking at. Uh, so you wanna make note of the color of the cap and the underside, uh, any color or texture pattern on the cap. What kind of wood was it growing from or near and is that wood dead or alive? Uh, you wanna note the size, shape and pattern of the underside, well, whether it be gills, pores, teeth, um, if the mushroom has a stipe and what the color or texture of that is, what is the growth pattern? Is it growing singularly clustered, shelf-like in a rosette pattern? Does any part of the mushroom bruise? If so, what color? To test for bruising, you just need to give that mushroom a pinch on its different features and see if it changes color. Uh, what season are you finding that mushroom in? A lot of mushrooms are very strict to growing in a certain season. So if you are familiar with Hen of the Woods at all, that is a strict fall mushroom. But if you found something that you think might be a Hen of the Woods and you find it early summer, you have misidentified that mushroom then. And then what is the overall size of the specimen? I also like to make note, it is safe to handle all mushrooms unless you were to be allergic. Uh, so please don't be afraid to handle these mushrooms, get a good look at all the features and even take some good photos if you want to identify the mushroom later or post to one of those ID pages I mentioned earlier. Now, when you're trying to harvest for identification, which can be really, really important sometimes when identifying mushrooms, um, it can look a little bit different from when you're trying to harvest mushrooms that you're trying to eat. So when you're harvesting a mushroom for identification purposes, meaning you want to take the specimen home to further investigate its identity, it is extremely important to collect the whole mushroom, which may include just digging your fingers a little bit into the ground, to get to the bottom of the specimen. Please don't go digging holes around the mushrooms. We don't want to damage the environment. We just want to take that fruiting body and that is it. Um, you also wanna keep the mushroom as intact as possible. If you get home and your mushroom is in five little pieces, it gets really, really hard to identify that. Um, I also suggest collecting a young and a mature specimen if you can. Um, the reason being is a lot of mushrooms can look different at different stages of their life. Um, and a lot of our resource books only will include one or two very picture perfect specimens um, to compare to. So if you have maybe a younger specimen and a more mature specimen, it's just easier and more likely that you'll find an ID in your resources. 
Um, a good example is the photo I used here. This is all the same species, but at different stages of its life. So you can see how some mushrooms can look very different at their youngest and more, more mature stages. Um, I also suggest to keep separated from other specimens if possible, just to avoid any confusion. Um, I like to so, uh, sort my unidentified mushrooms into like lunch size paper bags. Um, that way I don't get confused on where I find things. I can actually just write notes directly on the paper bag of, hey, I found this at the base of an oak tree and I can make notes directly onto that little paper bag, which is nice. Now, if you found mushrooms that you know you can eat and you wanna take some home to eat, um, here's how I think you should do it. Uh, you can cut or pluck your mushroom. I know that there's a lot of uh, myths surrounding that topic alone. Um, there's some fantastic long-term studies that finds no difference if you're cutting the mushroom from its substrate or if you're just plucking it. It does not matter, um, but I do suggest trimming off any super dirty spots of your mushroom with a mushroom knife if you have one. Uh, this just prevents dirt from getting all over your harvest and will save you tons of cleaning time later. Once dirt gets wedged into you know, the gills or pores of a mushroom, it gets very, very difficult to clean. Um, I also suggest harvesting or avoid harvesting from areas that are treated with things like pesticides or other chemicals avoid harvesting from treated lumber or close to, you know, busy roadways. Uh, also be aware not to damage the environment around you. Um, you know, you want to avoid trampling, damaging trees, try to follow the leave no trace policy the best you can, which you should be practicing anytime you are in the woods. Um, you know, if we are damaging trees or trampling things, you could prevent those mushrooms from coming back year after year. So we don't want to do that. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about edibility. Edible means it can safely be consumed. Toxic means this could have health related consequences. Non-edible means in most cases that the species is not eaten due to things like flavor or texture. Then there's unknown edibility, means we don't know if it can safely be consumed. You usually only see unknown edibility um, when we are talking about a really, really small mushroom that just isn't worth eating at all. Or sometimes there's really rare, rare mushrooms that we just don't know if they can be eaten yet. Now, just because a mushroom is considered edible does not mean there is zero risk. Uh, some people can have personal sensitivities to all mushrooms or even just specific species even if the mushroom is considered a safe edible mushroom. For some people, these sensitivities can even develop over time. Scientists have not found why this happens yet, um, but it does happen to some people. It is not extremely common, but it does happen to some folks. Um, to avoid any possible sickness, cook your wild mushrooms well. All wild mushrooms should be cooked thoroughly. Um, and start with small amounts if it's a new to you mushroom. Uh, if it's a new to me mushroom, I often will, you know, cut off maybe two bites worth, fry it up with some butter, salt, pepper, and just cook it thoroughly, eat it. If I'm feeling good after an hour or two, I can go ahead and make a meal with that mushroom. Um, and then again, do not eat a mushroom unless you are 100% sure of the identification go ahead and get additional confirmation of your identification from an expert that is highly suggested. Um, and then again, avoid eating mushrooms from areas that could have those toxin exposures, you know, avoid area, areas by roads, uh, mushrooms that are dried out or past prime or even have mold on them, uh, avoid anything like that. Now, where can you forage mushrooms on the Superior Hiking Trail? You can forage for mushrooms on this trail on Superior National Forest, state land, city land, but please do not harvest mushrooms from um, private property on the Superior Hiking Trail. Uh, please be aware this trail does provide food for many folks. Try to avoid harvesting all of something. A kind of recommended rule of thumb is to leave at least 30% of the fruiting bodies if possible. You know, only take what you are going to eat. 
Um, it is not legal to um, forage for mushrooms off of any of these lands and uh, sell them. So this is only for personal consumption. So please be aware of that. And then I'm just gonna talk about some of my favorite common edibles that I find on the Superior Hiking Trail. So first up, we have our oyster mushrooms. Now I'm just gonna cover the basic oyster mushroom. There are several other kinds of oyster mushrooms, but we're just gonna cover the basic oyster mushroom here, which we actually have three different species here uh, in our area. We have a spring oyster, which occurs on aspens or popples. And then our summer and fall oysters occur on hardwoods in general. Now oysters are just a uh, white, usually pearly white to kind of a little bit brownish on their cap. They do have gills that run down that stipe. Now sometimes that stipe is really hard to see because the gills run down it. So it's not super obviously a stipe sometimes. Um, but noting that it does have a stipe is very important for identifying this. Um, now the caps are typically kind of kidney shaped, semi-circular, but sometimes if they're growing more on top of wood, they can be more circular. You can kind of see uh, that image there shows more of a circular specimen. There are a couple lookalikes we can find on the Superior Hiking Trail. There is what they call oysterlings, um, which are very, very small, um, very, very thin white mushrooms. Um, the big easy difference is if you know what a spore print is, um, which is just a method of collecting the spores that those gills release, um, just observing the color of the spores can help you differentiate if you have an oysterling or an oyster. Um, an oyster spore print is going to be a white or even kind of a lilac -y color, where an oysterling is going to have a brown spore print. Um, but it is a much smaller mushroom. The oysterlings are usually kind of nickel to a little bit larger than a quarter size in most cases. So they stay pretty small, whereas you can see oysters can get pretty large. Um, there is also a, um, they call it a bear lentinus. Um, that is also a lookalike. And that one has more of a hairier, rougher cap, and it gets much more deeper brown on the cap as well. Now, next up, we have our golden chanterelles, cantharellus. This is probably one of my favorite mushrooms that you can find on the trail, and I find them very frequently on the trail. Now, this is just a golden kind of colored mushroom. It's one of the unique identifying characteristics for this is it has what they call false gills. Now that's very hard to really show in just an image, but what they mean by false gills is most true gills, if you were to run your thumb through the gills, kind of like pages in a book, they're going to move like pages in a book. Now with the false gills of a chanterelle, they're more blunted and veiny. Now that is again, hard to see in this image here, um, but if you were to feel them, they're not going to move like pages in a book, which is really important to make note of. Um, now these false gills, can fork, which means they can split off in different directions. You can see a little bit of that here in the photo. And they're also going to run down the stipe just a little bit. Another unique identifying characteristic of these is they peel like string cheese. You can kind of see how clean that peel is um, in this image here. Now this does have a few lookalikes. Uh, there is a false chanterelle um, that grows from uh, pine roots typically, and that's more of a deeper orange color. And chanterelles don't grow from wood at all. I should make note they grow terrestrially, um, usually late summer and into fall. 
There is also another lookalike that you shouldn't be aware of called a jack-o'-lantern mushroom. Uh, that one is actually considered toxic, so it's one that you should definitely be aware of if you're going to uh, forage for golden chanterelles. The, go the jack-o'-lantern mushroom is, again, a much deeper orange mushroom, and it grows in large clusters at the base of oak trees, where most of the species of golden chanterelles that we have on the Superior Hiking Trail actually associate with conifers. So I find most of our golden chanterelles on the Superior Hiking Trail with conifers. There are some other species that do grow with hardwoods in general, um, but the majority that I find associate with conifer. Next, we're gonna talk about the lobster mushroom, which is the first wild mushroom I ever harvested and ate off of the Superior Hiking Trail. Um, this is actually a really unique mushroom. And I strongly believe that if I had found any other mushroom um, for that first time, I don't think I would have gotten as interested in mushrooms as I did, uh, just because the way this grows is fascinating. So the species of the mushroom that we want to eat basically is hyp Hypomyces lactifluorum. It's a, it's a mouthful. Um, but this is actually a parasitic fungi that attacks other mushrooms. So the below photos are actually the host mushroom that it starts off as. That host mushroom is Lactarius piperatus. Uh, again, another mouthful, but it gets its name piperatus from being very, very, very spicy. Um, it's kind of like a chemically wasabi-like spice. It's very strong, but also a little chemically, but a very strong spice. Um, and it's typically considered an inedible mushroom because of that. But when that parasitic fungi attacks that host mushroom, it turns it into this orange blobby mess, um, and it will completely eliminate that spice. Um, so it's really, really cool how it does that. It, you can see it completely solidifies uh, the gills. So there's no more remaining gills on the underside of this lobster mushroom. But the host mushroom here, you can see it definitely is a gilled mushroom. Um, so it's just really, it's really fascinating. These mushrooms, you, you know, are given the lobster mushroom name because they also, not only do they look a little lobstery, they also smell a bit like seafood. Um, that smell gets way stronger as they age. Sometimes you will know when you are walking near an old rotting lobster mushroom because they just smell so strongly of not good seafood when they get that old. Um, but you wanna find a lobster mushroom when it's nice and brightly orange, once it starts going to um, kind of a maroonish color, that's when it's starting to get too far uh, past prime to eat. Uh, so this orange color is absolutely beautiful. Sometimes they will, you can see some cracking on this top side. That's pretty typical. Sometimes they can crack way more. Um, it just means they got a little bit dry and they're perfectly good to eat. Um, Sometimes you will still see some white from the original host mushroom and that's perfectly okay. I just make note that you wanna make sure that the gills are solidified over um, and you do want some orange on the mushroom. So I also like to make note that sometimes the stipe is still very present, but sometimes it can be nearly absent after it turns into a lobster mushroom. Um, either is pretty typical. And those grow terrestrially um, late summer and into fall as well. Uh, I think they go through the end of fall, but their prime season, I usually find them like last week of July, first two weeks of August are kind of my favorite times to forage these. And they don't have many lookalikes. Uh, the closest uh, lookalike would probably be a cinnabar polypore, which is a bright, orange mushroom that grows on sticks. Uh, so you're usually not going to, see, you're not going to see a lobster mushroom ever growing from wood at all because they grow terrestrially. So if you see what you think is a lobster mushroom and it's growing from wood, 
it is not a lobster mushroom. Next, I'm going to talk about lion's mane and its siblings. Um, we have three species of Hericium that grow in our area. So the first off, or first one, we have our lion's mane, Hericium arenaceus. Now this grows singularly or in pairs on living oaks. And this is basically just a non-branching clump of dangling white spines. Next, we have the bear's head. Some people call it bear's heads too. Um, this will be growing singularly or near others on dead hardwood or from wounds of living hardwood. And this is basically just a white branching mass with tightly packed spines. Next, we have our coral tooth, and that is going to be growing singularly or near others on dead hardwood. And this is just basically a white branching clump with spines that are not so tightly packed as the uh, bear's head. Now, all three of these are great edible mushrooms. They actually all taste similar to crab meat. Um, so I will often use them uh, to make crab cakes. Um, now, they don't have many lookalikes, which makes them a really easy to forage mushroom. Uh, the only real lookalikes to any of these are um, coral mushrooms in general. Uh, my rule of thumb is coral, true coral mushrooms. Don't be confused. Coral tooth is not actually considered a coral mushroom. It's considered a tooth mushroom. So just to avoid any confusion, true coral mushrooms will always grow upwards, whereas the lion's mane and siblings mushrooms will grow outwards and downwards. They will never grow upwards. Um, so if you follow that rule of thumb, you shouldn't get them mixed up with anything, but these are definitely my favorite groupings of uh, edible mushrooms we have on the Superior Hiking Trail. And they all grow summer through fall. Next, we're going to talk about just a couple uh, deadly mushrooms that I think you should be aware of. Uh, first, we have the Destroying Angel. This is one of the Amanita mushrooms. Now, this grows terrestrially, often near oaks or other hardwoods, summer through fall. And this is an all-white mushroom, so it's going to have a white cap, white gills. It does have a white skirt on that stipe. The stipe is also white. And it is kind of hard to see here, but this is growing from a basal bulb that we mentioned earlier. Uh, so kind of that egg in the ground. And this is also a good example why I suggest um, when you're trying to harvest mushrooms for identification purposes, how you just want to stick your fingers into the ground to pop that whole mushroom out. Because if you were to just pull this mushroom out of the ground, that basal bulb is going to get stuck in the ground and usually will get covered by dirt when you pull the mushroom out. So then you might not always see that basal bulb in the ground still. But if you were to pop that whole mushroom out with your fingers, you are going to see that it is growing from a basal bulb, which is very important when identifying these. Now, this is definitely one you need to be familiar with. It's one of the most deadly mushrooms in North America. Um, and it's honestly a very, very gruesome process. If you were to eat this mushroom, basically what would happen is you are going to feel fine for 12 hours. Uh, after 12 hours, you're gonna start feeling very sick, uh, a lot of gastrointestinal issues. You're gonna spend a few days in uh, the bathroom quite frequently. Um, and after about two to three days of feeling very, very, very ill, you're gonna start feeling fine again. But when you start feeling fine is actually when that toxin is attacking your liver and your kidneys. And eventually, um, if you don't treat that, you will need a organ transplant to survive. Uh, so this is a very serious mushroom. Um, if you were to eat it in total, it will take about seven days to kill you. Um, so it's a big no-no mushroom. The good thing is there's not many edible lookalikes to this at all. 
usually when we see people that have eaten this mushroom, it's because maybe they've come from another country where they do have edible lookalikes. Um, that is usually the only time we're seeing, you know, adults knowingly eat this mushroom. Next, we have the deadly gallerina. And this one I do see way more frequently on um, the trail just because the destroying angel mostly uh, is associated with oaks and we just don't have tons of oaks on the trail. Um, but the uh, deadly gallerina associates with hardwoods or conifers. Uh, year round, I usually see them later in the fall though, most frequently. Now these can grow kind of clustered or individually. Now the cap is very sticky or tacky on these, so they're fun to kind of feel sometimes. The gills are going to be kind of yellowish to brownish depending on where they are in their life. And the stipe is going to be kind of whitish brownish and will have a very faint ring. So you can see that ring there on this first photo and also still connected to the margin of the cap in that bottom photo. Now, sometimes the ring on this mushroom particularly will wash away in the rain because it's very kind of wispy and dainty. So you might not always see the ring on this mushroom. There are a lot of lookalikes to this. I would say the most common edible lookalike to the deadly gallerina is the honey mushroom, um, which I don't consider to be a beginner mushroom just because there are several toxic lookalikes to a honey mushroom, including this deadly one. Um, but there are lots and lots of small brown mushrooms that can look like this. So they can be harder to identify, but it's mostly suggested to avoid eating all small brown mushrooms because they are very hard to identify. Now I'm gonna leave you with some, some of my, ooh, wow, some of my suggested books. Um, there are so many, so many, so many um, mushroom books out there. I certainly have not read all of them, but these are just what I have and what I like to use. I have so many more books on my wish list that I would like to get. Um, I will say you don't need a tree book, um, but it is very helpful when you're trying to identify mushrooms if you can also identify the tree uh, that it's growing from or near. Uh, but if you are having trouble with tree identification, if you could at least focus on telling hardwoods from conifers, you know, maples from oaks, birch from aspen, you're going to get pretty far in mushroom identification because those are kind of the big ones. This first one I list mushrooms of the upper Midwest by Teresa Marone and Kathy Yarrick. Um, that's this little one here. That is probably one of the best uh, standard beginner mushroom books just because it's easy to use, easy to carry, um, easy to bring with you in the field. Um, so that's kind of the best go-to book. And then the rest of the books I have listed here are just good supporting books um, for maybe if you're not finding what you need in that smaller uh, Mushrooms of the Upper Midwest book, uh, then I will usually go to one of these four other books to find it. Okay, so uh, we can take questions. I have my email here if you think of anything later that you would like to ask me about. Um, if you also are interested in taking a longer class from me, I do teach classes. You can find them on my website or you can follow me on my Facebook to find more learning opportunities from me. Thank you so much, Ariel. That was awesome. Let's uh, end the screen share and we'll take some questions from the audience. Yeah, because they've got some good ones. <laughs> All right. Uh, first question is, are some of the species also found in other parts or that you covered are found in other parts of Minnesota? And if so, which ones? Yes. So all of the species I covered uh, today are found in all of Minnesota. 
Um, I will say when I made note of the chanterelles that we find in the Superior Hiking Trail mostly occur with conifers, I find that in other parts of the state they mostly um, associate with hardwoods. So that would be the biggest difference I would say if you're trying to use the information I gave you today to cover all of Minnesota. So, And uh, Charles Bishop asks, how often do you rely on spore appearance for identification aside from spore print color? Um, so I generally don't rely on spore printing too heavily. I It kind of surprises a lot of people, but I've actually never taken a spore print myself. Um, usually in almost all cases, you can use, you know, other macro identifications to come to or you know, macro features to come to your identification but sometimes it is a very very good tool to use especially when you're trying to um, really really dive into identification there's not many lookalikes that will have the same spore colors but a lot of times you will find in the wild you know mushrooms have already released those spores so you can just see the spore color evidence below the mushroom or sticking to the gills of the mushroom um, or even on the you know stipe itself so sometimes you can definitely see the spore you know color and spores itself just laying you know around the mushroom it's not super frequent that you see it with your naked eye but you can definitely see that somewhat frequently our uh Next question comes from the person who introduced me to the fascinating and glorious lobster mushroom by, we, we foraged one off of Lake County public land on the SHT and cooked it for dinner. Um, and it was really fun. So this question comes from Carolyn Cox. Hi, Carolyn. Um, how do you take a spore print from a mushroom without gills or pores like a coral fungus? Or uh, so that's, it's a really complicated one. So spore printing is definitely more suggested for mushrooms with gills or pores. Um, you can sometimes get results just by laying a coral mushroom on its side. I would put a glass bowl over it and then lay it on some tin foil. Sometimes that's the best way to get some of those weird ones but a lot of times you're not going to get anything from those weird ones like a coral mushroom. It's kind of, it's really, really hit or miss with those goofy ones, mostly miss, but sometimes you can get lucky, so. Tracy Gavis asks, I'm sorry, Tracy, if I mispronounce that. Tracy asks, I'm fairly new to Northern Minnesota. What is the best time to hunt for morels? Ah, so we actually just had our first morel sighting in Minnesota, I think yesterday. Uh, it was in the su more southern part, south of the cities. Uh, I want to say like Bell Plain or something. I wasn't familiar with the area. Um, but I would say for the northern part where the hiking trail is, we're going to find most of our morels actually with pine trees versus if you go to uh, the southern part of the state, you're mostly going to find it with elms because we have different species. But um, I would say for the northern part, we probably have, I would say maybe two to three weeks before it actually like really starts for us. Um, still another week or two out for the more southern part of Minnesota for, you know, actual season and that is subject to change based on how our spring is going so we'll see <laughs> I, I i used to forage uh, morels down in missouri and there was all sorts of lore around like when you knew they would be out is there anything so in missouri we looked for something called may apples and I, i've seen them here too it's a different kind of plant um, i think there's a different name for them in minnesota what people call them but um is there any kind of uh, correlation like that? Like I've always, I've started wondering if like once the lilacs bloom, the morels are probably out. Yeah, so um, I do know that in all of my morel spots that I have, there are may apples near them. Uh, they don't directly have, you know, an actual relationship. They just like the same environment. Um, but yes, it is often where 
they do grow in the same spots. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's good to know. I didn't know that they like to grow together. Um, okay, and then Tracy Hansen asks, "What about uh, chicken of the woods? When and where does it grow?" So, chicken of the woods is a spring through fall mushroom for us, um, and they like oaks, which is something that the spirit hiking trail doesn't really have much of which is why i did leave it out of this presentation um because you pretty much only find it in the duluth area on the trail but yeah uh, spring through fall on oak trees is where you want to look we do get that uh interesting kind of lake effect riparian stuff going on you know where there's more moisture and the temperatures are warmer and that's why we have more maples and stuff so who i mean there's definitely some places there are more oaks than than others mm -hmm. but um yeah pretty rare tree uh yeah and sean steiner asks was last year a tough year uh due to intermittent rain or should we expect each year to be a new game show each time such as finding the same mushroom in the same place each year um i feel like the year before last year was definitely far tougher i think that was the drought year Rain is generally good for mushrooms as long as they're not getting like drowned. But yeah, every year is a little bit different. You know, just how the weather treats us changes dates of, you know, when we're going to find things. You know, sometimes it can, you know, kill the uh, living hosts that the mushroom is associating with. So that will deplete it of its nutrients. So it's not going to grow then there's a lot that will go into this so really every year is going to be very different just got to enjoy the ride <laughs> sounds like a really cool way to learn to kind of read the forest and what it's up to that year how it's doing like um yeah as you learn how as you just do in a lot of ways as you're hiking or running or backpacking um you know i mean for learning how to kind of read the skies with the weather and stuff like that it sounds like another thing like that that's very cool um I think we mostly answered April's question but I just wanted to ask it um just to double check so she's just wondering are there morels on the SHT and what are the best places to find them and when so I will say morels are super uncommon here in the Arrowhead part of the state they absolutely do still pop up I did mention that the ones in our area tend to like the uh, pine trees. Um, and that's because we don't really have elms up here. If we were to have elms, they'd grow with the elms. Um, but we just really don't have much elms up here at all. So the southern part of the state, you want to you wanna look for elms in general or ashes even. Up north here along the trail area, they do like the pine trees. You're going to get the black morels with the pine trees and uh they are they are hard to come by but they are out there <laughs> um gonna go back to a question from charles because this was a uh, it's a great question and we talked about this tonight at length charles bishop asks um have there been reports of i am not going to pronounce this correctly hypomyces lactiflorum yeah infecting other hosts that remain toxic um, no, I will say there is definitely a lot more studying that does need to happen with the lobster mushrooms, hypo Hypomyces lactiflorum. As far as I know, officially, they infect uh, Lactarius piperatus that has changed its name to Lactifluus piperatus recently, though. Um, and then, um, oh, wow, it's the off season. I'm blanking on species names uh russell uh wow russella brevipes there we go i got it i got there um so those are officially the two known species that the lobster mushroom will take over i have seen some promising photo evidence that perhaps it has infected um a lactarius indigo which is a bright blue milky mushroom but that's not official you're not going to find that in any you know, uh, publication, but I have seen very strong, good photo evidence of that. And I do think there are potential of other species to be infected by that uh, parasitic species, but we, we really just don't know enough yet. And if you read 
what there is out there, people can't even um, settle on if that parasite, parasitic fungi attacks the actual mycelium or the actual mushroom. So there is a lot of study that really does need to still happen with that. They generally say though, like some books will say, you know, try to figure out the host mushroom of the lobster in order to eat it. Um, you really don't, there's never been an actual recorded toxic, you know, or no, no, no poisonings from lobster mushrooms as of yet. So I don't think that's anything that we have to fear. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's the best I've got. It is a safe mushroom, but there definitely is a lot of study that still needs to go along with it. And uh, Margaret Arnold asks, what is a typical foraging hike or walk for you? What is your approach? How do you prepare? What is the knife you showed? Ooh. I always carry, uh, I have a handful of mushroom knives. Um, and those are basically, you know, kind of like a, you know, fold out knife, but it has a brush at the end. So you can brush the, all the dirt off so you can put it in your basket. Um, but yeah, I, I hike with a basket, my knife. I have a backpack that I usually carry some extra paper bags in, my water, um, a whistle, um, kind of just the basics, you know, safety stuff. Um, but I mean, at this point in my foraging career, I hit a lot of the repeat spots. I'm not really going out to explore new areas as much. So I kind of know where my spots are. So I would say if I'm more in exploration mode, I um, will plan about a four hour hike in the woods. And I look for typically hardwoods because most of our edible mushrooms associate with hardwoods for the most part. Um, so I'll look for areas that have new growth, old growth, and a good amount of dead wood as well. So I want to look for new, old, and dead. A good balance of all three of those is a good area for me. Awesome, awesome. Uh, Deb Fleischman was hoping you could recommend an app um, that allows you to take a picture and help with identification. Um, so I will tell you that all of the mushroom ID apps are garbage. <laughs> um, they cause more poisonings than anything. Please do not use them. Um, if anything, I do highly recommend using iNaturalist. Um, I am very active on iNaturalist and I like iNaturalist because people can upload their photos. It, the AI will generate um, a recommendation of an ID. It's not always accurate, but it will give you a recommendation. And then also like other real people can see your observation and they can suggest a correction or they can confirm that ID, um, things like that. So I like having that um, option where people can actually correct, you know, the ID suggestion on there. Um, please don't use any of the basic ID apps for mushrooms. They are not where they should be as of yet. I, they, I think they will get there, you know, in some time, but they are not there as of yet. You guys are asking great questions. I'm so sorry. We're not going to get to them all. So we're going to take two more. Uh, but before we do, I just wanted to ask Ariel to, for those of you who we don't get to answer your question tonight, if you could, could you just repeat your email one more time for folks? Um, yeah. Uh, my email is arielsmushroomco at gmail.com. There's no abbreviation or, or no punctuation or anything like that. Just arielsmushroomco at gmail.com. Great, thank you. Um, and I'm gonna go back to Carolyn Cox because this is a question I wanted to ask too. So it's from me and Carolyn. What's your favorite mushroom to eat? Uh, I'm, like, do you have a favorite bolette to eat? You could ask me that every day of the year and I might have a different answer every day depending on my mood. Um, I would say um, kind of the lion's mane and siblings mushrooms are definitely up there for some of my favorites. Um, I also really enjoy hedgehog mushrooms, which I didn't cover in here, um, but that is also another good, great edible mushroom. It is similar to a chanterelle. Um, I just find it a little bit more meatier, I guess, a little bit. I do like lobster mushrooms a lot. 
Um, I'm picky with how I prepare my chicken in the woods um, because I do think it's a little bit mushroomy for me, depending on the age that you pick it at. But sometimes it can be up there. So it really, it, it changes, it fluctuates. There's so many good mushrooms out there. I feel silly thinking that I hated them all years ago. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, last question of the night will be, um, and this is coming from a couple of folks, is if you have any kind of just recommendations for the very beginner forager. I don't want this to sound like an advertisement, but try to take a class from someone who knows what they're doing. If you're not even in my area and you want to take a class in person from someone, I can recommend people that might be in your area. I'm well connected with educators all over the country, but I do suggest taking a class. I also suggest before you were to, you know, if you, if you really feel really confident about an ID that you've made, perhaps in one of the books and you're like, this has got to be it go ahead and send me an email um, and just get a confirmation. You know, if I don't know it, I'll know someone who does know it, you know. Also, some of those Facebook ID groups can be very helpful. If you uh, join some of those gr groups for your state or wherever you're from, you'll, if you follow along, you'll know who knows what they're talking about, um, whose word you can trust. Obviously don't trust anyone's word off of just that alone. Do your own research to whatever you get suggested, but those can be really helpful. So. Oh, fantastic suggestions. And I agree with um, Andrea Fumia shared, and I share this Andrea as well, that I'm really interested in this. And I, this is a skill that I want to develop, but I'm worried about picking something toxic. So th that's a great suggestion. And I, yeah, definitely just being able to be with somebody who is very experienced, who can, and just being able to see them identify them physically in person. That's, that mm -hmm. sounds like a really supportive way. And thank you so much for offering to also help people ID via email. That's amazing. All right. So that is going to um, end our Q and a portion of the evening. And we just want to Thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, we'd also like to give a special thanks to all of you who donated or joined as members at registration. If you have not yet done so and would like to do so, those links are in the chat. Uh, support from trail users like you powers our work of keeping the SHT beautiful for hikers and foragers and allows us to provide helpful trail information like this. Thank you uh, for joining us for this year's People Nature Footpath webinar series. To keep up to date on other SHTA events and trail news, you can follow us on social media or sign up for our monthly Trail Mix e-newsletter, which, and there's a link on our website for that. So thank you guys all so much. Happy hiking, thank happy you. foraging. Thank you, Ariel. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Night.